It says recording in progress. It's already recording. Okay. Yes. Good. Well, to you, Chairman. Great. Um, again, thank you all for your patience. Uh, welcome to the Tip Workers Coordinating Council Committee. My name is Jared Spann. I am the chair. Um, I am calling this meeting to order. Uh, quick roll call, please. Alan Karnofsky. Present. Andrew Klein. Present. Tracy Javier. Present. Jennifer McCahill. Present. And Larry Viegas. Present. Fantastic. Um, I would like uh, to approve the previous meeting's minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move. Second? I second. Thank you. The meeting's uh, minutes for March are approved. Um, I know that we have a couple of folks on from the public, um, either listening and or willing to chime in. If you are, please feel free to jump into the conversation. But because we are moving a little bit behind, uh, let's go ahead and get right to it. Um, again, I apologize for the late uh, email right before the meeting, but I hope at least you are able to view uh, the amendments that Mr. Julian sent over regarding the Tipped Wage Workers Fairness Amendment Act of 2018 and his proposed amendment. Um, Alan, were you able to review this, these documents? Um, I was not, unfortunately, okay. but I'm uh, eager to, to hear from them and, and have them walk us through their, their uh, edits. Great. So um, as Mr. Julian said, um, the essentially the first um, couple of paragraphs uh, basically provide an, an overall uh, statement as to um, their suggestion. Um, it focuses on a tipped credit wage statement, um, which would essentially from what I understand, put the um, or satisfy the requirements of the uh, Wage Workers Fairness Amendment Act while making it um, simpler and more efficient for uh, restaurants, businesses to uh, keep their relationship with their payroll companies um, and not cause an undue burden on those payroll companies by um, creating excess data. Is that, am I generally summarizing that correctly, Mr. Julia? You can come work for NPRC anytime you want, Jared. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, let me provide some overview. As you'll know, this all, this all started uh, back in 2018 when, as the council was trying to decide how to handle tipped wages after the uh, initiative, in the 11th hour, there were discussions with uh, both the Restaurant Association, the Council, and, uh, and DOES as to how to deal with this. They came up with the proposal that was memorialized. However, two things didn't happen. They didn't engage NPRC folks in those discussions, and they created a system, a process, that required the payroll providers if that were to be implemented to make extensive and unique changes to their systems just for DC. When this came to our attention, we began talking with DOES. This goes back several years. What you see before you today is our answer to DOES. You'll recall at our last meeting, we provided a lot of information, a lot of material to DOES. They responded with a letter that basically said, we read all your stuff, here's the statute. Okay, we were hoping for a different discussion, but I understand. And so we've responded to that. 
What you have in front of you is language that would amend the current law and provide that the goal of the council, the intent of the council, which was to ensure that tipped employees would know efficiently and in a timely manner whether or not they received the appropriate pay inclusive of their tipped earnings against the minimum wage. This is a system that has been used in other jurisdictions, most notably next door in Maryland. And as you see in this first page, what we've done is make this very, very simple. A separate statement, there's too much data to put this on your pay statements, on your stubs. So what this proposes is the following. Within two weeks of the end of every pay period, every employee will receive a statement, a tip credit wage report statement. And if you scroll to the end of this document, you'll see an example of what that would look like. This is something that will, for every employee, provide them with information on their position, their hourly rate, their tip credit rate, whether or not they received sufficient tips to meet the minimum wage, and if not, what the necessary adjustment would be. So it very easily and very quickly provides both the employer and the employee with information confirming or identifying a minimum wage payment issue. If there is a underpayment, then this amendment provides that the employer, upon receipt of this, takes the appropriate action to ensure the employee received the minimum wage. The check on this that does not require the employee to initiate any action if he or she feels they were underpaid. They'll know it, they have the information. The other part of this is at the end of each quarter, the employer has to provide DOES with any of the credit statements that were showing an underpayment and show, because he or she will have already done it, that they have corrected it and provide the corrected statement. So the process here is uh, within two weeks max of a payroll period, both the employer and the employee will get this report if it's necessary, they know what action to take. The employee knows that if that action isn't taken, DOES will know about it on their quarterly reports. Our experience in other jurisdictions has shown that this level of transparency and simple presentation works. The language that, so that's the proposal. The language in the bill, and I've given you two copies. One copy shows you, as we call it, the red line, where I've taken the bill, I've taken the statute, and I have edited, deleted, and added so that this language, if passed as a statute by the council, would provide this report to tipped employees. The other part I need to tell you is I got a call a couple of days ago from uh, Council Member Silverman. We all understand it is her committee that oversees DOES. I had not provided any of this information to the committee because I thought the most appropriate path was to bring this to the commission's attention. I'm going to solicit your support. And if I had, if we had your support, then I was hoping that both NPRC and the commission would reach out to council member Silverman's committee and encourage them to consider this language either as a standalone or 
incorporated in the BSA that has to pass in June. The council member was receptive, made absolutely no promises or commitments, and has shared this draft with her staff, with the committee staff. So the current status, this proposal is being presented to you for our discussion and your consideration. I would like to have your support and encourage you, if you can support it, to advise Council Member Silverman and her committee that you endorse it. And I intend after this meeting, hopefully with your support, to try and convince the council that the only way that this intent of the council can properly be realized is by providing this type of language. One last comment. I have said, and NPRC has said for several years to DOES, the significance of what you have proposed, and of course, we have not seen their final. We only saw their notice. Mm -hmm. But we have explained to them repeatedly that what they have proposed so far would require changes in the payroll provider's software only to meet the conditions of the District of Columbia that would be too expensive and too difficult for them to accept. And so the possibility that current payroll providers would abandon this market because of the proposed DOES approach is not a bluff. And I don't know how clearly I can say that. I can't tell you that every payroll provider would leave the jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that. But I am telling you that NPRC, yes, we would continue to manage the support of the employers over payroll, but it is not a bluff that as we had understood and as DOS, DOES has explained what they intended to do, that could result in current NPRC members no longer supporting businesses in the district. I appreciate your time. That's the overview. Unfortunately, Pete wasn't able to join us today. He had a conflict. Um, I'll do the best I can to answer any questions and anything that I can address. I will certainly get an answer and get back to you very promptly. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Um, I will I'll open it up for uh, any comments or questions. Yeah, the, the only thing I want to add to that is lest you think that what's being proposed here is to undo something that was given great thought and consideration by the council. Um, I can assure you that that is not the case uh, because I was involved at the time. And these provisions were literally added the night before the second reading. I was getting calls the night before the second reading, and I was scrambling to reach out to RMW Wrestling Association members um, to get their take on what it would mean. Um, there were a number of provisions that were just thrown in. I mean, this is what we call the sausage factory, um, and it's not very pretty, and sometimes the results are not very edible. Um, so, I mean, I just want to make it clear that, you know, the council, they were just throwing things in at the last minute and no one really considered, no one consulted with NPRC. Um, and there was hardly time for consultation with restaurant operators or even employees at that point. It was literally happening on a Monday night before a second reading of a, a bill where there had been a 20-hour public hearing on um so you know now that there's been time to reflect and analyze the new language that was drafted at the last minute um it's not a surprise that these issues have emerged um and are, are worthy of the last thank you uh um, i was gonna mention to David, I think um, the, the document you're talking about from DOES, the, this is the one um, where you said it was, I guess, burdensome. Um, and my team will correct me if I'm wrong. That, and I think I put this in an email to you when we had this discussion on email, maybe last month. Uh, 
that document is based on the previous legislation, so not the current legislation as it stands. So once once um, we're complete with our TIP portal, based on the current legislation, um, we'll issue new guidance um, that a new document that replaces that old one. Um, and I think that will also alleviate some of the concerns. Um, I'm just saying that that document that I think you're referencing is based on um, an old DOES document uh, on the TIP portal. Um, and it's the I, only DOES information we've been given for the last two years, Alan. Right, because um, we're, you know, once we have this new TIP portal established, we will um, issue uh, new guidance um, to replace that. Let me see if I understand correctly. Are you telling me that DOES in preparing for the TIP portal and in responding to the 2018 statute has prepared but has not yet shared how and what you expect people to do with that portal? One of the problems, I'm, I'm a little flabbergasted that we haven't been able to have more substantive conversations. I just have to say that. Um, but one of the problems that we identified early, and it's important, is the language in this 28 statute that talks about what the payroll provider will provide to DOES as opposed to other means that DOES gets information goes directly to this issue of the payroll provider's software. So if your proposal, which we have not seen, impacts how payroll providers send data, then until we see it, we can only base on what we've heard about before. Um, I know this. I know that what I've put down on this document is successfully meeting the intent that the council had in 2018 to ensure that all tipped employees were made aware in a reasonable period of time under a process that would ensure if they did not get their proper wages, they would get them because it would be known. I know this works. I can't comment on a system that you apparently have prepared, but haven't shared with us. I can't stop me, just so we're clear. It cannot stop me based on the information that I have and on my responsibility to the client to move forward with this proposal to the council. I still believe that the TIP Commission should look at this, see this as this works. It works for the employers, it works for the employees, it works for the payroll providers, it meets the intent of council, it does not cost the district government a dime. And unless we see some other proposal, this works. So why not go forward with this? I completely understand. Um, and we, I think we mentioned uh, at a previous meeting, we would allow user acceptance testing um, of the portal once we have it uh, ready for testing so that we can you know, receive feedback in real time before it does go um, live. Now for the issue at hand today, um, I, I don't have any specific comments right now on the, on the red line edits you've provided. Um, any change in the legislation would obviously delay what we're implementing right now with our tip portal so i'm just saying that if there's a change to the statute we would have to ensure we do as an agency adhere to any amended legislation um, which could cause a delay in execution and implementation of the new tip portal Ellen, can, you, can you tell me why you won't tell us what it's going to do can you i, I i'm just flabbergasted we're, we're building the tip portal based on what the statute is as it stands. So, um, and could you address any of the concerns that have been raised over the last two years from NPRC about issues that have to be taken into consideration? So, so from what I understand, you have issues with how the statute was drafted, and and we don't we don't draft legislation. We we uh, comply with the law, and so we're working to comply with the law as it's drafted. No, I think the issue want to it. raised is is how it would be implemented, and in in terms of issues with the statute, the issue is a practical one. Um, if I may, Mr. Chair, either through you or directly um, to Mr. Julian, however you prefer. It's my understanding 
that what's being proposed is consistent with what's been done in, in Maryland. Um, yes. So that's yes. Um, and is there any reason to believe that what's being done in Maryland is insufficient to meet the policy interest of, of protecting workers and assuring that they are aware uh, as to what their rights are with respect to minimum wage and that they're receiving the appropriate full minimum wage as tip workers? I guess Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that um, from our perspective at OHR, uh, we would need more time to look at the documentation presented because um, I haven't had a chance to look it over completely and maybe even consult our counsel at OHR, not to say yay or nay, uh, but just to take this information, look at it, and then um, compare it with what the law uh, requires just for the sake of argument. Um, I know that this, this is a uh, conversation that is important to have, uh, but I don't think that we're going to have an opportunity to make a vote today about supporting it or not, uh, because I just heard uh, a very important um, uh, uh, sentence. If we see another proposal, uh, I am glad that we have this conversation. Uh, maybe, I don't know if there are other uh, large organizations doing the same work regarding payroll uh, processing, but it would be interesting. Like, um, I cannot see your name, uh, David. Um, he said another proposal, and maybe that's an option. Not to say that what he says is not true, it is just to hear how are other people dealing with this. This is just a thought. We know how Maryland's dealing with it. I don't understand. I mean, yeah, but Andrew, this is this is Washington D.C. This is not Maryland. So we, we we need to we need to look at the law. We need to look at the at the at the proposal. By by all means, I'm not saying no, uh, but we cannot rush decisions based on something that. We haven't seen yet because it's not ready yet. So. Well, but in the meantime, the OES is going to plow ahead and, and continue to spend money um, on an approach um, that, that causes concern to the major payroll providers in the country that do business in the District of Columbia as represented um, not only through NPRC, um, but Pete Eisberg, as I understand it, is, is with ADP, is that right, David? Yes. P, who I think we all know. Um, and I've heard similar concerns from other payroll companies individually. So I don't understand what the hesitancy is. And if there's an issue with the statute, which there apparently is in terms of what's being required, and it doesn't provide the information that's going to be useful to employees, and we're not going to have a competitive uh, a payroll processing market among these companies because some are saying we're not changing our software to do that. Then I think we have a responsibility to act and not keep kicking the can down the road as DOES continues to spend money on on something that does not seem to be a viable approach based upon the available information. That we have. So may may I ask one quick question? What is it in the um... So, with what you're proposing, David, what what is it in the law that this doesn't satisfy? Is it the fact that it's like this data is not on an employee's pay stub? Is it the fact that we're creating you're creating a second a second document that comes out two weeks later, or why why isn't this why doesn't this fit with the way the law is written right now? I understand the question. Alan has said today, I believe the following is the situation. We were told and never heard until just last month that all the information we had responded to about DOES's proposal and the issue that we raised had nothing to do with the statutory language. I mean, I believe, I mean, my concern is we've been led down a rabbit hole. 
But our concern was never with the statute. And in fact, if you look at the information that's been provided, the one page summary as well, is the problem was DOES, and now I'm being told that's because that isn't what we were doing, that's what we had been doing. But what we were told was that these were all the things that DOES was gonna require beyond what was in the statute. And that is what caused the concern. What I've heard from Alan today, if I understand correctly, is the following. We have no idea in the world what DOES is gonna ask either the employer or the payroll provider to do consistent with the language of the statute. Because DOES, however far along they are in that process, has not identified a point where, for example, they were gonna ask a payroll provider to do something in the portal, but didn't contact the payroll provider to say, if we asked you to do this, could you do it? So I have really no idea how to respond to what DOES is saying in terms of, well, we're just following the statute, not the old way, because we haven't seen it. I can tell you this in answer to your question. What I did was take a look at this statute and say, if you wanted to incorporate the proposal from NPRC, which is basically based on the Maryland proposal, these are the changes that you would have to make to the statute. If these amendments were made to the current statute, then the council's intent in 2018 to make sure employees knew, tipped employees knew if they received the proper wage would be satisfied because of the report that's at the end of it. So I took the statute, since they told me that's what to work with, and made the statute, made the tip report that we proposed comply with the newly worded statute. Whether or not there's anything else in that statute as, as DOES is interpreted in it and hasn't shared, I have no way to address. We've addressed everything that was the intent of the council in the amendment that we provided. I mean, okay, but I'm still, and, and forgive me if I missed it, but I'm still confused as to why the wage statement that you're proposing doesn't comply with the way the statute is written. Why does the statute need to be amended? The statute does not provide for the specific tip credit wage statement report or for this process of how to notify. I mean, these are the details that follow the statute. It's consistent with the statute. It's telling you how to implement it. The change is, the statute in 2018 did not consider the whole tip credit wage statement and the tip credit report as how to implement it. Might be what DOES is doing. So what this does is not change the statute in terms of its intent. It edits the statute so that that intent is carried out through this tip credit wage statement. Does that help at all? I believe so. Hey, this is Zach Hoffman, by the way, guys. I've been here for a couple of minutes. I just wanted to jump oh. in and let you know I'm here. Thank um, you. If that helps with anything. Also, can, can we please hear from Alan? Because I don't know if Alan is either unsure or unqualified to make a comment on, on these comments that uh, Dave is making. He's making some good points. But do we need to talk to the director of DOES or who, who else do we need to talk to? Because I haven't heard anything from DOES about any of this since our last meeting. Uh, I assume, I don't know when you got on, Zach, but I have been talking. I can repeat myself if, if, if but you, you haven't don't. said anything, Alan. That's what I'm saying. You're talking, but you're not saying anything. But I don't, I don't know what you want me to say. I, I said DOES is compliant with the statute as it is currently. I said we will provide I you. I want you to have. I want you to have some response to the, so the I think questions response. and comments that are being made throughout this long, lengthy process that's been going I'll on. Like I just want some sort of. You, you were cutting me off already, so uh, I don't know what I don't know what you want me else to say. And uh, this group has provided edits to the legislation as it stands now. EOS complies with the law as it stands now, and that's how we're developing our tip portal system. Um, We've, we've 
provided comments back to NPRC, said their issues that they raised are issues that need to be raised with the legislation because they identified certain criteria that are in the legislation that they do not agree with. We don't legislate. We are executing the TIP portal based on the current statute. So if there are edits to the legislation, as David has brought forth, we are considering those edits as this council, as a TIP workers coordinating council, and we can support or not support. Um, but now this is the question of, uh, I think NPRC was asked the question, what does the TIP wage report looks like, look like to their belief under the current statute? And so that's what we're dis discussing now. Yeah, so let, well, let me see if I can ask my question a different way. If when the TIP portal is finished uh, and this and and employers are required to uh, submit these wage statements, can they submit something that looks exactly mm -hmm. like or very similar to what uh, Mr. Julian brought to us? Would that would it be legal? Would DOES accept it? Alan, you may not be able to say because the tip portal is not finished, but it sounds to me like there's there's no reason, Mr. Julian, for you to expect that the answer would be no, just as much as Alan can't or won't say that the answer would be no or yes. One of the, one of the issues that we have with DOES, and I think it's a good example, when they did the legislation in 2018, as Andrew has explained, it was, you know, last minute stuff. And one of the provisions, I mean, there was a provision that said that the restaurants had to use a payroll provider, for example, which I believe, Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the first time that it had been mandated. But there was also additional language in the statute, as I understand it, that could very well be what DOES is doing in their portal that talked about what information the payroll provider would provide DOES rather than what the employer provides DOES. That's a big deal. And one of the issues that NPRC had and identified early on and never got feedback from DOES was having the payroll provider provide this information as opposed to the employer is something we need to talk about because of the way the softwares have been created. I don't know, for example, whether or not the system that DOES is proposing, consistent with the statute, says that a payroll provider will be the one who supplies and files this data. If that's the case, that's a problem. And we could have dealt with it if we knew that's what they wanted to do by talking about it earlier. This proposal makes sure that those lines are clean. The payroll provider provides all the support to the employer that it currently does in addition to helping to create this report. But the employer, not the payroll provider, is the one that provides that report to DOES. From our perspective, it's not just a question of who does what. It's a question of how do you get it done most efficiently. So that's an example once you get into the weeds of why I'm saying Okay, we'll see what the, you know, we will go ahead and I, I can tell you this. It is my understanding from the client and I've heard nothing that would change this, that NPRC does intend to contact, the, has contacted the committee, will bring this to the committee's attention in absolute total ignorance of whatever it is DOES is doing, but based on what we've been told in the past, we need this is a way for the council to implement the 2018 intent and amendment, period. And I can't, uh, on behalf of my client, I can't do anything else. If I simply wait and see what it is that DOES releases whenever they release it, and it does in fact have the kind of issues that regardless of current versus past, interferes with the reality of how this business is run, we're going to have a problem. So I'll just say, and I'm, um, I apologize if I'm misunderstanding exactly what you're saying, but, um, and secondly, I certainly wouldn't 
uh, purport to understand what the council was thinking per se when when these things were written. Um, but as a tipped worker, I can appreciate the idea of the third party payroll company acting exactly as that and keeping that separation between the the employee the employees and their employers is for me extremely valuable and i think for this council extremely valuable that uh if the way i understand it is that the council is asking that the, the payroll company provide this information because it, it's just if, if we they were to do it the way that you're suggesting which is have the employer submit the information well we're just back at square one where if an employer wants to manipulate those numbers then they can it's having the third party payroll company in between that would help prevent that and again I, maybe i'm misunderstanding but i see the value in that yes andrew yeah i mean i just with all due respect i don't see how we can expect the third party payroll companies to be regulators they're not going to do it they're going to leave the market and i think that's one of the issues i mean they just like accountants, um, unless accountants go in and do an audit and do an audit, um, they're going to the accountant will give statements based on information provided by um, the client. Um, and the payroll companies are no different. I'm not here to stick up for payroll companies, but I am concerned that if they're concerned, they're not going to do business here. And that is one thing that I've heard repeatedly is they are going to be expected to somehow certify what it is that their clients are doing, they're not gonna do it. And I don't blame them because if I were their lawyer, I would advise them not to do it also because they don't know unless they go in and are on site and examine all of the records, which is a payroll provider given, given what they're paid to do what they do, they're not gonna do that. Um, so I hear what you're saying. Um, I just think in the real world, that's not really gonna happen because they're not regulators. What they do is they provide, they, they're they provided information by the employer. Here's what our payroll is. Here's the number of hours people work. Here's what you need to pay them. Um, here's why you need to pay them that. I think that's what this law does is why it is you need to pay them that. But then the payroll provider relies on that, prepares the payroll and prepares certain reports including the tax filings that go to the federal government, the IRS, um, the tax filings that go to the district. And in this case, reports to DOES based on the information that's provided. But if you're thinking that there's that this somehow is gonna provide an additional check on what employers are doing, I don't have any problem with that, but I suspect the payroll providers are gonna say, we can't do that. We're not doing that for, you know, whatever, how many dollars a month per employee they get for processing payroll. They're just not going to do it. Jared, two quick things. One, payroll providers are not getting out of the system. And, the, and Andrew has correctly identified the role. They receive the data from the employer. They prepare it as your accountant would for taxes. But without being on site and auditing, there's no certify that this information is accurate. Um, but they, but what would happen, because this I think goes to the to what you were asking, is because of this report and because the employee also knows what hours he or she worked and how much money she got in, he or she got in tips, the whole purpose of this is to, and the payroll provider would create this report based on the data that it got from the employer. But the whole idea here was consistent with everybody doing what they currently do, this creates a document for everybody, employer, employee, DOES, and to the extent that it's provide, prepared by the, even the payroll provider. This is the way you can say real quickly, does this employee, did this employee receive the total wages she should have received for this period. It's a it's a binary question. It's yes or no. And that's what this report does. Once you put that information out and you're 
responsible for seeing how it's distributed, including the employer's responsibility to share these reports with DOES on a quarterly basis if there was an underpayment and show they corrected it. You're not putting any burden on the employee to confront the employer, to complain to DOES, or anything like that. They share a surprise that we're, we're talking about an implementation of a law that was passed in 2018. And you're out, you're telling us that we don't, we haven't even seen yet what's going to be proposed to implement it. I mean, I, just, I don't, I don't understand that. We've had meetings, we've had discussions. I've been pulled in, into this issue. I don't know how many times and to hear today. That's like, yeah, you don't know what we're going to do because we haven't shared it yet. With, and is that what I'm hearing with respect to a law that was passed in 2018? How can that be? Then you're talking about DOES. Um, I am, yes. So, so it sounds like there's issues that you have, not, not you, Andrew, but you, David, have with the law. Because it requires third-party payroll providers to send these reports to DOES. Yes. That's so one that, of the issues. That's absolutely true. So that is not that is not a DOES issue. That is absolutely. I want us to agree on something. <laughs> we can agree on that, Alan. Absolutely. And I, I acknowledge Andrew that it it has taken time to develop this this system after the amendments were made, um, and I can acknowledge that. And as I've mentioned, we want to be able to get feedback on a system um, during the user accept acceptance testing process from the people that will be using it, from the third party payroll providers that can provide comments. And we can we, we do this with other IT systems that we implement where we get feedback and we make tweaks where needed. So I just want to make that clear. But this is not operational. I mean, we want to see what's being asked because, I mean, in one instance, and I don't remember what the issue was, Dave will know better than me because he's closer to it. Um, but there was something that was being asked that wasn't wasn't even in the law. I mean, it, it went you know went further than than what was required. So I don't think this is just a question of operationally does it work? How does it interface? There's also a substantive issue as to whether. The requested information is what is required by the law that was passed by the council. Um, so I think before you spend a whole lot of money on on software, which you may have already done, um, and a system, that it would be prudent to share what it is that's being asked, so that those of us who have clients and those that do business. Um, know whether that's what's required by the law or not. And I also think from the worker standpoint, um, it would be reasonable for them to know what it is, um, the information that's being provided. I mean, what um, uh, David has provided on behalf of NPRC, where there's a concrete statement where you can look at it and you touch it and taste it and feel it, um, I would think, and and um, I will defer to our chair and the other employees that are on the commission. I would think that that would be very helpful in what would be desired um, in terms of information. I mean, what we're talking about here is not regulation by the payroll company of the employer. We're talking about transparency. We're talking about making sure that every employee has a is given. Um, information so they know that they've been paid what they're required to be paid under law um, which is every employer's responsibility and the issue has been there are those that have said well, we don't really know because we don't have the information and i think that's fair and the council obviously thought it was fair because they you know they they wanted to do this so i think what we're grappling with um Notwithstanding the law that was passed, you know, that was conceived at 11 o'clock the night before council vote, um, I think what we're grappling with three or four years later, um, three and a half years later, is what's the best way to do that? And if the best way to do that is, is not contemplated 
by the current council law that it ought to be amended. We ought to do it the best way it can be done so that it is um, manageable for employers, manageable mm -hmm. for payroll companies who the employers hire and are now required to use by law, um, and and provides most importantly, and I should have said this first because it is the most important, provides the information that is useful and helpful to the employees who, who this law is intended to benefit. And if the current law doesn't allow that to happen, or we're three years down the road and we don't even have a pro forma as to what the statement is going to look like, then I think we're well advised to say, hey, let's put the brakes on that. And let's do something that we have in front of us where there's a statement um, that um, I would hope employees would find helpful. And if not, then let's figure out how, how to make it provide the information that's that's necessary for employers or employees, sorry, to ascertain whether they've been paid in accordance with law. Um, okay, well, I think um, we certainly need to, uh, as, as our own counsel, decide um, whether this is something that we can uh, support and uh, recommend to the DC Council. Um, so I'm going to propose that we hold a vote uh, at next me next month's meeting, um, and so and and we can obviously uh, offer time for comment and that sort of thing, um, and then based on that vote, we uh, draft either uh, a support or don't. I guess. Um, does that sound fair to everyone? I'm going to do it more formally. I'm going to move right now that we support it, um, but would be sympathetic, and, and if I get a second, um, would be sympathetic to a motion to table that until next month. Second. I'm moving that we support it. Yeah, I second that, Andrew. Then I will move that we table it to next month's meeting. I second that. So, Mr. Chairman, I just second what you yes. said. Yes, I heard you. Thank you, Larry. Um, in the meantime, so let's vote on the tabling. So just so we have our Roberts. Well, I'm on Roberts' school. Oh. So let's make sure we vote on the table. So we're all clear. As well. <laughs> uh, all in favor of tabling to next month. Aye. 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 The ayes have it. Oh, I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. So, uh, next month it is, um, I will, uh, communicate with Tom on an exact date very shortly, but expect whatever yeah. four Thursdays from now is. Um, thank you, Mr. Julian for your time again, um, and your passion and dedication, uh, to the discussion. Uh, help. thank you all for, again, your patience and joining us. Um, if, if in the meantime, um, folks want to reach out to me and or other, well, folks want to reach out to me, um, please do so. Um, and please have a chance to thoroughly look over, um, the documents that Mr. Julian, uh, spent hard time on. I apologize again for getting to you, getting them to you late. Um, but if that is all we have, I will motion to uh, close this meeting. Second. Thanks. Fantastic. The meeting is closed. Thank you again. Uh, and we will see you all next month. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, members of the commission. Bye-bye. Thank you.